Okay, so I'll just get started then. Um, if people join uh, as we start talking, then we can just admit them and they can just join in. Okay, so um, hello everyone and thank you for joining us today. It's great to see so many of you supporting us. Uh, welcome to our webinar on the missing majority, younger generations seeking climate justice. Today's event is a collaboration between ClimateWise and Restless Development as part of London Climate Action Week. My name is Catherine and I'm here with ClimateWise and I shall be moderating the event. I'm also joined by one of our founders and co-directors of ClimateWise, Justin Branton. Just to provide a short overview of ClimateWise, uh, here we, our mission is to provide meaningful change by offsetting carbon footprints and improving the lives of those in the poorest communities. Alongside this, we also support companies in the climate positive journey with our three stage approach that involves calculating the carbon footprint, facilitating ways to reduce it with our partners and then enabling them to offset the unavoidable emissions. We are also joined by Puvi Mehrocha and Charles Mangwazi uh, from Restless Development. So Puravi is a program coordinator based in India and Charles is a youth research manager based in Uganda. Restless Development is a non-profit global agency that supports the collective power of young leaders to create a better world. They train, mentor, nurture and connect thousands of young people to use their youth power and lead change today. So today we're going to discuss youth climate justice and the importance of supporting the younger generations to facilitate a climate movement. We're aiming for our discussion to last about 40 to 45 minutes, and then after that, we'll open the floor to questions and insights from our audience. Okay, so let's get started. So we're first gonna to turn to child, Charles, sorry, over to you. Um, so how are younger generations being impacted by the climate crisis? Thank you for that um, and the wonderful introduction. Um, if I could say one thing, I think uh, what we found is that climate change is not taking place at an abstract level, but instead it's in neighborhoods and in the places that young people live and work. So very much and to a large extent, young people's lives and their livelihoods are being disrupted by environmental changes and climate change as we see it unfolding. But what we've also seen is that um, in most cases, when we talk about climate change, we talk about it as though its impacts will only be felt in the future. Whereas in reality, um, it's young people, especially those in low income countries such as Uganda that are already feeling the brunt of these impacts. So they're feeling it now, it's not in the future for them. And I kind of like the emergent emphasis that we're starting to hear more and more about taking care of people and planet. Because yes, young people do depend on the planet for their livelihoods. We all depend on the planet actually, and without it, there's nothing else. Interestingly, from our research, um, where we're looking at the impact of climate change on young people's lives in Uganda, we saw that in the past one year alone, more than 76% of the young people that we spoke to said that their livelihoods have been disrupted. And with these disruptions, um, young people are starting to experience climate-induced trauma and anxiety. So firstly, young people are anxious about the future. They're anxious about both the direct and indirect effects of climate change, which are causing ripple effects to many aspects of their lives, such as their education, um, their physical health, and also their mental health. But secondly, like I mentioned, whilst they're anxious about the future, they are presently traumatized about the experiences that they continue to face firsthand um, from the impacts of climate change. And most of this trauma, like I said, is being induced by climate driven loss, um, damage to their households and properties, and also displacement from the communities that they live in. However, to a very large extent, the mental health of young people is continuously being neglected in important dialogues that we have around climate change. So even at um, platforms like COP26 and so on, there's not enough emphasis on um, young people's mental health as it's being induced by climate change as well. But whilst all this is happening to them, um, what we've also noted from young people is that they're not just passive and letting climate change happen to them. 
they're instead trying to adapt and respond to these impacts um, in real time as well. Some of them are doing this by switching to alternative livelihoods um, that are less natural resource dependent, so such as um, starting up mobile money agencies or getting into more motorcycle taxis, small scale enterprise in um, setting up street food kiosks, especially um, that's what we're seeing from here in Uganda. Um, and also with climate change largely impacting their income and their livelihoods, young people are seeking ways in which they, be, they could become more resilient and they're doing so by joining village savings and loans associations, VLSAs, which are continuously becoming common in these parts of the world, um, where they're able to access affordable credit um, that can make them more resilient to the impacts and the shocks that they're currently facing. For young people that are still focused in the agricultural sector and they're still rooted in there, um, most of them are turning towards plant and drought resistant crop varieties and trying to explore low cost small scale irrigation systems as well, um, so that they can be able to become more resilient to the impacts of climate change. However, in the course of um, responding and adapting to climate change, young people face multiple constraints and barriers. One of them is the livelihood dilemma where they're trying to switch from the agricultural sector or from natural resource dependent activities to those that are less natural resource depend dependent. However, even if they switch, so um, they're meeting high cost of living, um, high cost of inputs and raw materials, and above all, um, less profitable markets, which in the end is kind of driving them back to less, to more natural resource dependent activities and agriculture, where they continue to face um, the impacts of climate change at a large scale. Uh, lack of financial resources is also a big issue for young people. Um, they're not able to effectively adapt and overcome the impacts of climate change without adequate financial resources. Um, and also as, as they continue to experience climate-induced trauma and anxiety, they do not have adequate accessible mental health services to help them overcome this. Um, most importantly, I think one of the biggest barriers that young people are currently facing is the lack of access to relevant climate change information, education and training that would otherwise enable them to make informed decisions and effectively adapt their lives. And then also the lack of um, an enabling civic space where they can really come through, put their voices to the front and share their lived experiences about how they're um, being impacted by the climate crisis and how best they can be supported. So their voices simply need to be heard now more than ever. So how can we support young people to overcome the climate crisis? Um, if you take away anything from uh, the findings and youth insights that I'm sharing, let it be these four things. Uh, firstly, we can support young people by increasing their access to financial support. So promoting more informal financial services such as the VSLAs, which is just one aspect that I mentioned, but there are definitely more avenues that can be explored. Um, just to help young people access more affordable credit uh, to help them diversify their income streams, but also become resilient to the shocks and stresses that they face from, from climate. Um, we also need to strive to create climate resilient jobs. So as a civil society, as the private sector, even governments um, should aim at strengthening mechanisms that foster the creation of not only green jobs, but properly paid and reliable jobs to young people. And I feel like this will offer them a sustainable pathway to greater climate change resilience. Um, and on top of that, I think we need to continue to prioritize access to education, information and training for them, both through formal learning structures and informal learning structures and bringing this education to the community level where it can be widely accessible to um, the young people that are in the front lines of fighting the climate crisis. And at the top of it all, I think um, as a sector, we need to provide a, a more enabling civic space for youth engagement, um, whereas we can 
perhaps facilitate stronger and inclusive dialogues uh, between young people and decision makers so that they're given the space to amplify their voices, especially the voices of marginalized youth and young women, and ensure that they're not being left behind in the delivery of climate action and sustainable development. So I'd like to end by a quote from um, one of the young people that we spoke from, from Eastern Uganda, uh, who said, look, um, you need to consider the ideas of young people. Although most of us come from humble backgrounds, we have rich ideas and all we need is a support to implement um, some of these climate actions in our respective communities. Amazing, thank you for that, Charles. Um, would anyone else from our panel like to say anything else about how younger generations are being impacted by climate change? Just an approve it. No worries. Okay, so Peruvia, I'm coming to you with the next question. Um, research has shown that younger voices are needed in decision making uh, regarding climate change, but what is the state of representation like today? Right. Thank you so much. And I think Charles also kind of touched upon it, like, you know, how we are seeing uh, the voices of young people as well as uh, the representation of young people, how that's impacting, and what impact is it really creating. And as we all also know that climate change is something which is acting as the most pressing issue and young people are now more than ever most severely affected by it as uh, like, you know, their idea of a just and sustainable world is started to get affected because of it. So if we look at like um, the, uh, the future uncertainty, or if we look into the issues related to health, mental health, education, all of it has you know really started to get impacted as well. So uh, based on like one of the program that we are doing here in India on climate change, it's called the Youth Climate Action Lab. Uh, so through that, we are also implementing and trying to focus on that, how young people can lead the accountability around the commitments that have been made by the government around the state climate action plans and trying to understand the kind of impact that uh, climate change is actually having in uh, the informal settlement colonies. Um, so, and that work is going to be focusing on that, how young people are also representing and advocating for these commitments that have been made by the government and uh, kind of looking into how can they hold the, um, the major stakeholders more accountable on those terms. Um, also, if we look at in terms of the state of representation today, so um, like, you know, young people uh, through the program, also the Youth Climate Action Lab program that we are doing, they're also kind of taking charge of the way that climate change is really uh, impacting them as well as the people of the community. And through that, they are also trying to, you know, better shape a response around it rather than just sitting and thinking that, when they will get an opportunity, that's when they are going to act on it. And, uh, you know, so, but all said and done, it's also that there is still a lot to be done in order to have the voices of young people uh, and vulnerable communities to really come into decision making and getting that, uh, you know, much, much deserved representation. So uh, in order to actually look at it uh, from that perspective, so whenever, and we've seen in the past as well, that whenever young people have actually got that opportunity and the correct way of representation for the work that they have done or the suggestions that they've been making, we have really seen how uh, the shift has really happened. And uh, in terms of like improving the policies or making that ground level impact more meaningful. So, uh, so this is definitely, a, it's a continuous process uh, where listening to young people and tracking the commitments uh, will really act on having better representation for young people. Yeah, just wanted to add that. Direct those people donating. Uh, so you're on mute. Thank you for that, Peruvi. <laughs> so um, I was wondering, thank you for that, but why do you think younger generations are so disproportionately represented in climate policy decision-making and in climate action in general? This is open to anyone from the panel. So Justin and Charles, feel free to jump in as well. Uh, look, from, uh, 
I think there are some generalizations to be made here, but when when you look at the kind of population of the world and actually the proportion of the population that young people make up, they don't have a representative voice on on any organization. Um, and I think um, you know maybe Charles and <coughs> Paul V kind of hinted at, to, at it is that they need a space where they can actually engage with decision makers or whether that be uh, political decision makers or uh, people actually who are holding the purse strings. <coughs> And they need to have that space where they can actually engage in that safe environment and actually discuss the issues that are affecting them on a on the ground level. Um, and as Charles kind of, I think, alluded to as well, is when you are impacted by climate change, you will probably come up with the, the solutions to either adapt to it or to combat it because it's personal. It, 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 you, you're invested far more than sometimes a lot of uh, policymakers who tend to be a little bit isolated or insulated from the overall impact of, of certainly uh, climate change. But I think it comes down to um, that there's never really, or not just in climate change, but almost in any aspect of society, that the last voice to be heard tends to be that of the younger generations, yet they're the ones certainly within climate change are gonna be most adversely affected by the ongoing climate change. And therefore, you know, their voice is absolutely paramount. And as again, Charles kind of alluded to, um, and I know certainly with, within the UK structure, um, it's a growing mental health problem in terms of the, not, I don't jump into despair, but the fear and uncertainty of the future and what that brings. It would adversely, uh, adversely affect the young gen generations far more than my generation, as an example. Um, so therefore, it is absolutely crucial that they'd have that voice and they get engaged. Um, but as, as we've kind of highlighted, that there's a, certainly a lack of opportunity for that engagement to, to occur. The fact that that engagement was relatively poor at COP26 highlights the underlying problem. Um, if at this global stage, stage we can't get the voices of the young people, generations heard properly, what chances are going to happen at the local level? That's great, thank you. Um, so at the heart of the discussion here is the climate emergency. And as mentioned, this uh, event is a collaboration between two organisations, ClimateWise and Restless Development. So do you each want to give a bit of an insight into what you're doing um, to combat the climate emergency? We can start with Justin with ClimateWise first. Sure, happy to go. I mean, Kat's already alluded to it in terms of why we set up our organisation. Um, and it really was when we, when we first decided to, to uh, invest in this kind of area, in the space, it was trying to empower uh, individuals um, to, to make a change and make, make a difference. Um, we certainly looked at what we were seeing on the ground from... Um, you know, the, the people's voice from the ground and crying out that they, they want to change. And we saw historically what's happened at previous COPs. Um, but we realized the underlying uh, problem with a lot of these models is that there, um, there are a lot of promises made and sometimes the promises are far bigger than the action on the ground. And there was a disconnect between government saying one thing and, and the product on the ground level actually occurring. So we set up an organization, Richie, which looks to try and crowdfund uh, and ra raise money to actually start to develop uh, projects that actually have an impact on the ground. And our projects are focused, the primary focus driver really is um, trying to either sequester carbon or prevent carbon release going into the atmosphere, compounding the underlying problem of, of global climate change. Um, but we've never solely looked at that. We've looked at all our projects that actually have ancillary benefits, and those benefits are looking to provide equal opportunity employment and education development. Um, and for us, the education, equal opportunity employment and green recovery is absolutely crucial because those, those factors are linked to sustainability. Um, when, when you educate people and give them uh, the ability to make informed choices, more often than not, people make wise choices because they have all the information available to them so that became a, a real kind of driver for us um, and we what we decided to do was look at how can we best raise uh, money in a meaningful way that's actually going to start to actually make meaningful change at the ground at the ground level um, so so we started off with individuals but we moved to um, big corporate organizations and thinking well what can we provide them that allows them to make a better informed decisions and how can we and then kind of raise some cattle from these organizations that make a change elsewhere in the world and that's through as Kat you've alluded to earlier was well we can support companies to understand what their greenhouse gas footprint is and we can help them calculate their overall gas greenhouse gas footprint and then we can help them uh, make decisions that start to reduce their overall impacts on the environment so a company that's producing 200 tons of co2 equivalent per year 
um, we can help them develop a 10, 15, 20 year plan to try and get that towards um, you know, zero. And in the intervening time, if they can offset the residual difference to minimize their impact, we can utilize those funds to then create new projects up and up on the ground. And our focus really has been trying to drive that, that financing into the areas in the world that could probably need the most support um, outside of uh, the wealth, wealthy nations. And when you look at, and I know restless development will say this, where, where is the population growth coming from? Where are the young populations? It's in the developing world. They need the most support. So if we can drive our money into those areas. And as they up, uplift themselves to uh, alter their, their economies or alter their, their livelihood, we can provide them the funding that allow, allows them to do that and to empower them to then make a change on the ground. And that's hugely important to us. So that's why we kind of came, came into existence, really. We, we looked at what was happening. We saw that governments are kind of saying a lot of things and they are making changes. But there was a report out in the UK yesterday, which um, kind of uh, ranked our government in terms of its climate uh, agenda. And they gave, they gave the government four out of 10. And the underlying message was uh, their words are far greater than their actions. And, and that's the reality. Governments change their, their policies to get hijacked by new crises and things distract them from you know, wars in Ukraine, as an example, to COVID previously. Uh, and the climate agenda constantly gets pushed down and things that actually matter now because we don't make the changes now. The, the future is, is looking somewhat bleak and um, sometimes get pushed further down the road because actually... They don't see the immediate impact now, but as Charles has alluded to already, the impact is happening now and it adversely affects low income uh, and young people far more um, than it does older people who have some insulation away from these effects. So, you know, that's why we came to development. We thought if, if we can raise money that starts to make meaningful change on the ground, um, that's got to be a good thing. Thank you, Justin. Um, Charles and Peruvi, as you're dealing with different regions in the world, do you want to talk about the projects happening with restless development in your different areas? Yeah, sure. Um, I'd like to just build on what Justin said. Um, it's really important to, you know, mobilize resources, financial resources, but more than that, making sure that they're being channeled to um, where they're needed the most, where most of the young people that are being affected or at the front lines of the climate crisis are. Um, and I'd like to just start from that point by emphasizing that, you know, our efforts to build a green, inclusive and sustainable world would all be in vain if, you know, the very people that are at the front lines of fighting the climate crisis, the young people themselves are being left behind. So more than ever, they need to be at the forefront of decision making on matters that affect them. And in terms of um, some of the initiatives that we're taking towards this, we're also coming from a point of realization that uh, climate action needs an intergenerational and intersectional approach that engages different types of young people, you know, marginalized young people, young women who also face um, uh, additional barriers and impacts from climate change and also recognizing that the climate crisis is also a justice crisis and a gender crisis. So really looking at uh, climate action from an intersectional approach and an intergenerational approach where we're both having input from older generations that have the power um, and hold the keys to decision-making, but also bringing young people on that same page um, who will be feeling the brunt of uh, climate change now and in the future. So, we're um, doing a campaign uh, which started last year called the Missing Majority Campaign. Um, and coming from last year's COP, which was actually dubbed as the most important COP of our lifetimes. However, it, it remains to be seen whether it achieved uh, what it wanted to or not. Um, but I was at COP myself. And one major thing um, that I noticed was that young people were being excluded from the most important decision-making forums where, you know, the actual decisions, um, the packages and all of the discussions were being made. You would find them in other spaces, in the corridors and side events, but not in the key decision-making rooms. And this exclusion just goes to say a lot about um, the seriousness that policymakers uh, have towards young people. So without the inclusion of these voices of the world's younger generations at such crucial times, 
climate action or any climate initiatives that we may be taking on as a world will definitely fail. These young people need to be at the center of this. Um, and young people themselves are expressing that they want to be part of the solution. However, they face daunting obstacles as they try to do so, including a lack of resources, um, uh, a lack of access, especially to, to such platforms, to such forums, and also just the necessary capacity that they need to effectively contribute to this. So with the Missing Majority campaign, which we started last year, we supported um, a number of young people to go to COP26, just to have additional voices of young people there. Um, but we wish to engage other partners, um, collaborate with civil society, to mobilize as many young voices and support them to have the access to COP27, especially which will be in Africa. So that would be monumental for young people in Africa who are also facing um, the brunt of climate change impacts. So um, with this campaign, people could join us and support youth power by firstly, I think the most important thing, handing the mic to young people, whether it's in within these platforms, whether it's on socials, whether it's on any channel where their voices can be made, um, young people must be given the mic to, to have that platform to speak in important dialogues, especially. And then also going further to engage young people to build climate action plans. Um, we feel that such plans when developed collaboratively with young people would really help deliver uh, the support that they need um, to adapt and respond to the climate crisis. Uh, so for example, uh, we would like to see uh, maybe an establishment of something like youth sustainability envoys or young people that are selected as representatives from every country on a short term, maybe a year to two, um, that can effectively contribute to the design and implementation of both national and international climate commitments. And like Povi alluded to earlier, um, the key point of also being part of such decisions is that young people then have the opportunity to hold leaders accountable to the actions and commitments that they make. And then also just going further by um, perhaps supporting initiatives that are taking climate education to school, because we've seen that this is where a big gap is um, in terms of access to the necessary information, um, but also the capacity that young people need to not just be in the spaces, but you know, to influence, to effectively um, also advocate for other young people and uh, really bring in their input into decision making. So the best way we can prepare younger generations is by educating, training and providing information for them. Um, to support their adaptation and mitigation of climate change. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll pass it to Povi if you have any additional words. Thank you, Charles. I think, yeah, immediately uh, you have covered everything that we've been trying to do to tackle climate change. But just two more important things, like, you know, when we talk about young people taking charge and uh, taking action for climate change, um, one thing that I would say like often we find ourselves at a dead dead end, like, you know, once we have started to work around something and, you know, we really feel uh, this is going to really help change around the dialogue that we are having around climate change. But then uh, we also look into uh, trying to understand that there would be some uh, movements, there would be some actions that people would want to take, but there is still a bit of limited access and resources that's available to them. So in terms of that, uh, resource development is also, uh, you know, trying to build up on something called like a youth fund, where we also, you know, want to fund uh, people, we want to fund uh, grassroots level organizations who can really, uh, you know, take on the work that's, that they have started around climate change to, uh, you know, actually uh, show a bigger impact that it can. So that's one another thing that, uh, you know, uh, and. I think like, you know, many organizations and many uh, foundations should also like look into that aspect of it because that's something which can really impact and encouraging the um, 
people who are also trying to uh, start something around that dialogue and conversations of climate change and um, another thing just to end it like you know so even as a strategy of looking at organizations like both climate wise and justice development that work with people on climate change and you know have that basic foundation so uh, you know so even looking at a strategy of power shifting so like you know totally believing into what young people can really bring to the table and you know trusting that from you know, their own experiences because many a times what happens is that people don't really trust young people that they have the adequate experience and the skills that may be needed and that kind of often limits them in terms of the needed representation as well bringing the decision uh, decisions um, in policies or ground level so uh, that's also another thing uh i thought like you know just to add around uh, power shifting as well as the youth fund point of view thank you thank you it's great to hear about the initiatives taking place globally to get people involved in climate action so just as a final question um what as a panel would you recommend to any young activists who might be tuning in today yeah uh maybe i can just start yeah, off and <laughs> others can add in so major i would like to say uh, because i am still at this stage of life where you know i'm trying to understand that what really we can do as young climate activists uh, and the work that we want to do so a uh, few things which really helps me understand and you know uh, helps me go in that direction is that uh, you know so you know taking that resolve to not give up trying right so in whatever capacity whatever efforts that we are making um all of it ultimately going to be worthy of the efforts that we are making so it's okay if we are not starting with something that's too huge or that's going to bring about a revolution that revolution can come from within us as well so the most important thing is not to you know uh, give up trying the other thing which i thought was also that you know um the steps that we are taking so it doesn't really uh, you know uh, have to be seen from a, a lens of that uh, you know uh, like i really will have to go all out and uh, you know do this project do that project or you know have this impact but all of it can really start from our own uh, initiatives as well right uh, you know there's no need to go all big out uh, and uh, like you know to really be an activist for climate change it's uh, like you know so we can really in uh, initiate dialogues with people that we care about and we can volunteer we can write about things that really uh, matter to us so these are some of the ways uh, uh, that you know we can really look at uh, you know the young activists who can start their journey also for climate change and lastly like you know uh, we can all also try to get associated with organizations that are working to you know really bring about a meaningful change and uh, continue to expand our own understanding about what climate change really means and what changes is it bringing uh, about in the Uh, environment that i uh, we are staying in you know so continuing to speak and growing in our own understand so that's something uh, i would say like you know would be like a meaningful and active youth engagement where we are using our activist uh, skills yeah yeah that i i just want to kind of reinforce exactly what to what we just said there really i i just kind of wrote down some words uh, for me really and those words will that they all came up in that conversation for me young people really are they 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 still have that growth mindset the ability to to want to carry on learning and developing and looking for solutions and i was what i suggest is never lose that never transition to this fixed mindset a uh, form that you can't make a difference because you can make a difference whether it be from the individual level or influencing the people immediately around you or influencing up never stop that belief that you can make a difference and it doesn't matter whether it's, it's on the micro scale or you know on on large scale constantly look for solutions um as i said before my experience with young people is they tend to be solution providers um highlight a problem but then also try to identify a solution at the same time because sometimes you can't rely on other people to do it um so never lose that that kind of belief the influence uh, as previous was kind of sharing sharing dialogue is hugely hugely important don't become a silo in terms of your knowledge um be willing to share it and i always say with knowledge is it comes power really um 
share that knowledge, empower more people to make better decisions or more informed decisions, um, influence people by your actions, by your words, um, but actions also speak are hugely, hugely powerful. And also I'd, I'd ask young people to remember that you are the first generations coming through now who can influence actually influence um your the older generation's behaviors certainly my generation i was influenced by my parents behaviors and my old generation so i kind of aped what they did i enacted what they did but so younger generations now can absolutely influence the, their, their elders behaviors and we we're far more willing to follow what young people say now because actually their voice is hugely hugely important and you only really get um, equality in the world when everybody has a voice and if your voice is not heard then we're not really representing the world as a whole so don't stop, keep pushing, um, start small, um, but influence out. I think that's a great way to uh, conclude this discussion. That's great, thank you. Thank you so much to our panel for these informative insights and thank you to our audience. I hope you found this insightful too. Um, we're now gonna open up the floor if anyone's got any questions or anything you'd like to add to our discussions, please feel free to unmute yourself or even pop something in the chat. Yeah, Tim, I can see his raised his hand, please. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, because we face such an urgent situation, um, needing to get big emissions cuts this decade, I feel that priority needs to be identifying who will actually make those big emissions cuts and most of them will need to come from the wealthy nations because they account for most of the emissions and it seems to me that it's the banks which campaigners need to focus on because if we threaten their profits they're likely to be much more responsive than the governments. The governments have spent decades talking about climate and achieving very, very little. So I wonder what people think about there being strong campaigns in wealthy nations where the money is to threaten the reputation of the banks among their customers so that they become responsive to moving their funding away from fossil fuels. No, I agree. I just, I think that's already happening in some um, places. I know there's a lot of people actually changing banks um, from these ones which are investing in the oil. So I think that kind of transition is happening, but um, obviously we need a, a lot larger scale. But no, it's a really interesting point. I think, um, Kevin, it's a good point. That is happening, but what's probably not uh, as apparent as how, what sort of size scale is that happening? I know uh, recently I, I had some communications from uh, my pension providers and banks in terms of what they're doing um, and where they're investing their monies now. Um, and as Tim has just kind of alluded, uh, the more we talk about it in kind of open platforms, the more that these big uh, corporations are aware of it, the more that they will transition uh, their, their financial resources into areas that actually meet the market's wants and needs. So actually, again, that communication is hugely, hugely important. Um, you know, you, you could argue that, you know, what Extinction Rebellion did kind of really raise the profile, but the, all that will be lost if we stop talking about it. Um, but on an individual level, individuals can make that choice in terms of where they start to invest their money. So what I would suggest is absolutely talk about it, influence behavior, change and raise awareness for the big corporations. But on a local scale, I'd, I'd say to individuals, look closely about what, where you're, where you're, your banks or your pension providers are actually investing their money and if you're not happy move it to a pension provider or a bank who is investing their money in the right areas has anyone else got anything else they'd like to add sorry i've just seen a message in the chat are we doing enough to reserve fossil fuel I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm sorry, Andrew, I don't know the answer to that question. So he says the energy crisis could get uh, worse during the winter months. Are we doing enough to reserve fossil fuel? Justin, that might be one for you. I know you're probably a bit more well-versed in this area. 
Uh, as in, uh, uh, I missed the question. Are, are we doing enough to? Cons what, what was the question again? Right, to build on it a bit more. <laughs> Oh hi, yeah. Sorry, I'm yeah, I'm quite no. new to uh, Zoom, so excuse my uh, <laughs> you know elementary uh, steps there. Sorry. So uh, basically, what my question is, uh, just to you know, jump in the conversation a bit late there, uh, are we actually doing enough? Uh, obviously, there's an energy crisis here now, um, and are we doing enough uh, for the winter months um, to alleviate you know any sort of energy shortage that we might have? I think it's it's going to be you know more you know i don't think we're quite seeing the bigger picture yet um and i think that uh, it might roll out in a few months time um but obviously if we're hitting an energy crisis now already can you imagine what it might be if we hit a really bad winter um you know if we've not got reserve stock if we've not got reserve uh to get us through that period how are we going to do it how, what's going to happen is the energy prices i predicted the energy prices and as in the petrol prices would go up to like two pounds fifty um in fuel uh by the end of this year i wonder if that's really going to happen that's what i'm sort of getting to two pounds fifty is going to be quite uh, high yeah. <laughs> you're not wrong and you, you i mean there's every indication there's there's no kind of let up at the moment in terms of the direction that the the fuel crisis uh, um is certainly heading yeah. are we doing enough um i i would say look from my perspective no we're not are we focusing on the right areas again i'd say from my perspective no i think that we could do more to transition to renewables for far less okay. uh, far more quickly than trying to do short-term gains in terms of increasing production if you look at north sea and I'll, I'll speak from this i used to work in the north sea north sea um, i used to be a well site geologist um, <clears throat> when i first left university um the reserves aren't huge. The, the oil fields tend to be quite small. They're quite uh, expensive to get to in the first place. And then even when you bring the oil to, to shore, it's not going to replace the shortfall that the, the dispute over in Russia and Ukraine is currently causing um, because they produce min millions and millions of barrels per day. And we might be able to increase our production by a couple of hundred thousand barrels per day. That, that's reality. But we could have a huge uh, impact in terms of how we, um, we, we waste energy hugely within within certainly within this country but also within the developed world um for far less money you could spend that money on cladding and um, <clears throat> basically insulating houses so far less energy is, is wasted if we had a more robust transport network people wouldn't have to rely so much on jumping into a car or you know a vehicle to get from a to b um so there's lots of things we can do but none of them are short-term solutions so I think the reality is it, there's going to be a huge impact over the winter months as people have had to make a decision in terms of how do I heat my house versus um, how do I get to work. Yeah, um, there's a lot of uh, a yeah. lot of what you so a lot of what you suggested there they're, they're more long term solutions to to a problem that is is literally just around the corner and going to worsen. You know, yeah, very very quickly. That, that they are, they are. I mean, I mean, cladding insulation. You know, you, you could start to drive that up. Um, solar powers, wind farms. You, you could drive that production up. But there's no quick solution in terms of increasing oil, oil production or gas production either. You know, um, an average drill might be 120 days to access a new new uh, new field, which might might then be found to be nothing there or not enough resources or uh, abandoned in a well. Um, and and going back for a short term solution um, might. I think history teaches us we've, we're very reluctant to uh, row back on something we've just invested in. So if we start to invest in, in fossil fuels again as a short-term solution, it won't be a short-term, it, it will be a consistent thing. Um, there is no easy solution to this. Uh, I, I imagine what will happen over the winter months is we're going to have to go to the outside world to find out where we can get our resources from, whether it be uh, you know, uh, liquefied natural gas from America, um, but we're also going to have to make decisions in terms of how we we uh, utilise um, our our networks um, going forward to to access energy, and we, we're going to have to make uh, more informed decisions in terms of how we get from A to B. Um, I, I think that that is reality. Unfortunately, uh, once again, it's certainly the poorer communities that are being impacted the most. Um, I think it will. Uh, I think it will actually impact right the way up the chain because um, you know obviously transporting goods, transporting you know any any sort of it's going to really sort of impact everything in the end um i mean i, I you know 
obviously, you know, that it, it's something to be concerned about. Um, but uh, the other side of what I was sort of going to bring to the table was that we, we're only producing 20% of, um, you know, 20% of all energy is being produced by renewables. Well, that's what we say at the moment. Um, and of that 20%, um, you know, most of it is being provided by stuff that we burn still you know it, it's biofuels you know it's not really you know we're we're, we're producing something like 1.6 percent via solar 0.4 percent is um by a thermal uh you know using heat from the ground yep. um it doesn't really you know so, so, you know, we're not really doing what we could be doing uh, in the way of, uh, you know, the transition's not really happening very quickly. And my feel, feeling is that it, it comes down to, it's, it's not just my feeling, my theory, sorry, let's put it like that, is because I think it's the, the technology is not moving um, uh, and it's not moved fast enough. So, um, yeah. That's... I think they're definitely, yeah, for me, there's definitely barriers around technology, but there's plenty of technology out there that we could utilise and we, we're not utilising because there tends to be other barriers in the way to prevent that technology taking, being utilised in the first place from uh, not in my backyard uh, to, you know, actually governments not really incentivising uh, that new technology to to take place. When you, when you subsidise the fossil fuel industry to the extent that it is uh, subsidised and not other industries uh, to an equal level. Of course, we're going to have this dis disparity in terms of where we're going to put our investment. Um, mm. And until that really is kind of hammered home, you've, at one stage you've got the government saying, oh, we want to be net zero by 2050, but then they're trying to open up a new uh, fracking mine in, in the middle of Yorkshire. Um, you know, again, I just saw something come up from Tim about onshore wind farm. Oh, oh onshore wind farms but again you know people see it as an eyesore what i would suggest is a coal power fire station is is more of an eyesore than a wind farm um okay. and so it's trying I, to I, overcome public i i went yeah. to reset next i'm glad you actually brought that up as a topic because it actually leads me in very very nicely sorry i don't mean to hijack the whole if anybody else wants to jump in here really I, i'm hijacking it a little bit here but i just want to quickly jump in there and sort of say about the uh the wind um farm so the topic that came up about wind farms and I, i'm you know obviously i'm, I'm renewable pro renewables um and they've got, I've got my own reasons for that but one of the things that came up about wind farms that i think is is under you know and this is what i was sort of saying the the impacts of what are the impacts of the um uh renewable renewable energies that we use today uh, one of the biggest impacts that uh, obviously solar is is, is only taking up 1.6 and wind is taking up like a huge slice of renewables it really does provide quite a lot in the way of you know our, our, our renewable gains um but one of the things that we don't know about one of the quiet things that we don't know about are things like um the fact that they can actually have their single point of failure so if, if they fail um that's it power goes off you know something happens um you know of of a uh, presidential scale you know some sort of uh, natural event happens and those wind turbines they go off and there's no easy route of getting them back on um, but what's even more worrying than that is that in America, there's, there's been a study, and I'm trying to get a bit more information on this, and I'm building a bit more of a case study about it. In America, um, there's about half a million birds that are, that are culled each year as a result of wind turbines. So, you know, I've started a debate about this, and people sort of really jumped up about it because they were like, well, you know, uh, uh, birds are kill, killed by cats and all sorts of, you know, so they, they had some fair things to say about it, you know, cats and dogs and all, you know, birds die all the time, you know, it's not the end of the world. And then I sort of sat back and I, I waited for a while and I thought, you know, you're right about that, really. But then, then it, it just sort of kept on ringing a bell like you know these half a million birds in just the usa so how many birds are dying across the whole planet and then you start thinking what if they're right like an endangered species or something like that you know then half a million birds all of a sudden is like well that's the whole population gone of an endangered species so we we don't actually know what the impacts are of the technologies yeah. that we're putting forward you know in that capacity but um 
you know, yeah, again, you know I, I, I don't, I don't know things, the, the, the bird stats, but you're right. With most technologies, there's always going to be some sort of learning that takes place 5, 10, 15 years down the line. It's the same with hydro, hydroelectricity dams. What's the impact further down further down the, the, the river? But it then becomes a, a decision in terms of um, we do this or we do this. What's the worst impact or what's the best impact? And that comes with science and, not, and knowledge and gains. You're right. Um, and you're right again. If if there is, you know, if, if there's no wind, you generate no power, which is why there needs to be uh, flexibility and capacity within the system. You need to be able to access power from other areas. So again, I think going forward, you've got to look outside of individualized nations and actually nations looking to share resources. So if some part of Europe, as an example, has wind and access power, it can be transported around other parts of Europe and vice versa. Um, and you, you've got to start work looking on a on an international scale rather than on a national local scale as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I think that, um, that there are, you know, that, that's just something that, that needs to be investigated a little bit more. You know, how, how many birds, what types of birds uh, are dying as a result of these um, wind turbines going on, which are brilliant technology, you know, and obviously the most worrying th thing is that we don't keep using them for the moment, you know, because obviously we, we have got this, this climate issue. Mm you know it's um yeah uh you know th th thank you very much for um you know for, for for having me you know and uh are, are you are you are you quite scientific in 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 your your understanding of uh, of the various uh, technologies that are available um i come from a science background and an education background yeah. so i tend to dabble in lots of areas i wouldn't say i'm an expert in any area but um yeah i do come from a science background okay. before i leave the conversation we will leave the conversation there's like a video I'd like you to check out and I'd like you to, uh, to, to, to give me your uh, opinion on it. Um, sure. If, if that's okay. And anyone else who's on the chat, you know, I appreciate that feedback. <laughs> Sorry, carry on. Anyway, <laughs> I'll stand back now. There's a, there's a question there about uh, onshore wind is very cheap. Government should stop planning restrictions against it. That's, that's probably a good, yeah, good question. It, it, it comes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't disagree. But then you get local. I said it's not my backyard syndrome. That's right. Yeah, you can't have it in your back. You can't actually have a wind turbine in your backyard. Is that right? Yeah. Sort of... Yeah. So no. it's yeah. No. <laughs> Perfect. Cat. Anything? Any, any other questions? Uh, no. Unless anyone else has anything else to say. Thank you, Fat Andrew. Thank you. No worries. OK, so, uh, yeah, just just lastly, if I can just leave you with this, um, yeah. I've come up with a bit of a, an idea for a technology. OK, and um, I can prove that I think that it works. OK, I think that I can prove that I think it works. Um, it's a modular technology and it just requires a little bit of uh, moving forward from where I am at the moment. So I've got a prototype of it. Um, you can see the video of it, but basically how it works is it works by motion alone. Okay, I know you're recording this, so that's quite good, but it works by motion alone. Okay, so um, I am going to potentially, I'm looking, I think, at crowdfunding, you know, so I'm looking for young people to get involved in it, uh, if possible, spread the word. Um, I'll put the video link. But what I want, ideally, if anyone can watch the video, and give me an idea if you think how this technology works, okay? Because 2% of all industry uses either solar or they use thermal energy, okay? You might be aware of that. Only 2% of the entire industry, the entire rest of the industry uses a turbine to generate electricity. Yeah, Nikola Tesla, the turbine, you might be familiar with that side of it okay so that's what drives everything nuclear at the end of a nuclear power plant you've got a great big steam engine and that steam engine fires a turbine and the turbine spins round, and that generates electricity okay so that's the element that we're thinking we could actually improve and during the lockdown um i did around about three years worth of work on this uh, topic and I invented something that from ground up provides electricity so what you see in the box is essentially the invention but obviously I don't want to 
take it out of the box because of I've got IP issues. I have actually patented a certain amount of it, um, but there's a certain amount that still needs to be patented. So um, I just like some feedback. You know, I'm at the early stages and I'd like some feedback, but check it out. The video's there. You probably just about be able to see this because we're in the light. I was trying to get a little bit more of a darker room going oh, for the experiment. Oh, there we go. Uh, I'm in a dark room now, yeah. And oh, oh, look, are those lights already on? I think they're already on. So basically, it doesn't take much though, but a small amount of motion. Okay, you can imagine this being like the the sea, you know, and mm -hmm. we've got a thousand of these things, and we got like you know loads of light going. So that's the idea. It doesn't use. Uh, Oops. I need as many places as I can showcase this. So what it doesn't use is it doesn't use um, formal, you know, your formal formats of electricity, a turbine or anything like that. It uses its own technology to generate the, uh, the power. Oh, hold on a moment. Did I send the video? There you go. There's yeah. the video. Check it out. All right. Well, nice. thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Sorry for hijacking the, the end of it there. <laughs> I hope it is worth it. <laughs> Any comments that you've got on YouTube, I really appreciate as well. Perfect. Amazing. Well, thank you everyone for attending our webinar today. And yeah, that's it from us, unless anyone else has anything else before we end this. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much for all your support. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Okay, thank you. It was wonderful being on the panel. Yeah. Bye. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Go back. Corby, thank you. That was amazing. Charles, that was amazing. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. You record all that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, actually, I'll just stop it now.